Today, we're going to take a look at some of the most creative and best performing robots of the FTC decode season. A pretty easy way for teams to be able to start getting more than just one gate. I'm Coach Pratt, and I've been teaching robotics and design for over a decade now. And today we're going to take a look at some really interesting indexer designs that I've yet to see any other team make, some super impressive autos, some interesting ways that you could get two robots in one base, and we'll also analyze the newest world record for the autonomous period. So first up here, we've got team 19589 Falcons. And I want to take a look at these guys because I want to show you their intake, which one, I love that little compliance. I love that little vector wheel intake on the inside to be able to push it around. Let's see if we can't go back a little bit and we'll show that again. It's a great little vector wheels on the inside to be able to push things around. It kicks it up into what looks like a hooded flywheel at the back, but it's not actually the flywheel because if I was actually on its side. And the reason I want to show this is I think a lot of teams are kind of getting stuck in this idea that you have to have a robot that is designed in the center because most of the flywheel designs we've seen are centered in the robot. The thing about having a centered flywheel design is it makes it really challenging to figure out how do you package things. You could still have an offset flywheel over to the side that still is pretty easy to be able to accurately fire and turn and rotate for what it is that you need. And it makes it a lot easier to package those balls. And not only does this design for the Falcons here have a indexer on the side, but it also has it tilted at what looks like a 40 or 30-ish degree angle. So that also makes it easier for you to be able to package things inside as well. A super creative way of putting that together. Nice work on that, Team Falcons. Next up here, we've got some autonomous sections here. We have Team 25751 from Dread Pirate Robotics. I want to show this one because it's a double shooter, and it's pretty impressive as well. And it is a side intake on this mechanism wheel. So if you look, the intake on this drive is actually on its side. And that's an interesting way that they have been able to add up a little bit of extra space perhaps for staying out of those motors. Nice little uh, rubber band kick, nice little pull. And I'm not sure if their robot is moving at this speed just because they have slower drive motors or if they've slowed it down because they found that makes their autonomous more accurate. Last thing I want to show on this one here is at the very end, watch how their robot finishes. Boom, right there, done. Not only are they off that leave line so they get the three points, they're also setting themselves up for success so that when their teleop starts, they can drive right and collect the next three balls and immediately start firing in. Very cool stuff. One question I do have about this robot is the intake is on one half and the launch is on the other side, which works great if the balls are in the back. But autonomous, it does mean that there needs to be a lot of rotation happening. So maybe this was intentional from the teleop so they can drive backwards and grab some. But having to change your angles will really hurt you and i'm not sure if that design is going to be helpful or hurtful but it's something to think about next up we've got team 21094 this is north star and they've got a pretty impressive 12 artifact autonomous here and i want to talk about some of the strategies some teams are taking for their different autonomous so some teams are deciding to shoot the first three open up the gate and then pick up the next nine I think that's probably a more advisable technique than where North Star is taking this. They're taking uh, 12 and they're scoring three as an overflow. And uh, with that overflow, they're actually leaving about two, four, six points on the table by not opening that gate after that first intake ends up happening. It might even be possible that you could intake on the far left-hand side of your robot and open up that gate as you fire those balls at the same time. Something to think about, in any case, really excellent work here from that team. Next up, we've got team 24064 from Itkan Jar, Jankatastrophe, uh, and they have a 15 uh, section autonomous here. So let's take a look at theirs. thing I really like with this design, one, I love seeing driver robots, not driver robots, lights on the side of the robot. It's really great to let them know what state they are inside. Excellent stuff. It really lets those drivers know that we're set up and they're really bright. So that's really cool. And also it looks like their flywheels are also slightly colored so they can pick up those lights as well. I think that's pretty slick. So they're able to grab all of the pre-baked intake sections on here. If they happen to be matched up with a team partner that is not capable of picking up any toms, I think this is a great strategy. One thing about is how are you going to be working with your teammate? And we'll talk more about that later in other points. In any case, excellent job on this team, 24064. This is a really impressive autonomous to already have functioning at this. 
And uh, the next section later in this video, we're going to take a look at what teams can do to make their autonomous even better once you run out of all these preloads. I want to share this little intake here from a team on Discord. I can't remember the name because the number was not actually shared with me, unfortunately. So I'll try to put this in the description below if they do uh, comment and share it out. But I think this is a really unique way of getting the ball itself up into their trance. So they have two little rack and pinions to be able to lift it up. I, I'm just always a big fan of trying different ways that you can make things happen. And I think this is a really creative way of getting it in. Now, they did mention to me it's quite rather slow. So you could be able to gear this up because you're not going to need a lot of torque to be able to bring it up. But it's, I think that a racket pinion may be slightly more reliable over time compared to a little small kick arm, especially some of those small kick arms that may not have been made with the most robust materials on some of them that I've seen. Next up, we got team 22411 Wild Squirrels. We took a look at these guys last week, but I wanted to show you just because I think they have a great little example here of in their driver section, being able to just quickly pivot their robot back so it's always facing on the turret. I think that having a PID control or PIDF control so that you're always facing back on turret is going to be really important this season, especially when defense is getting played. You don't want your drivers to have to manually rotate your robot back. I think that's going to be a, a bit of a mess. Next up, we've got Fondy Fire Network. I'm not actually sure what the FTC team name is on this one, unfortunately. But it's really cool to see a functioning swerve drive up and running around and having some really quick turn and rotation. Swerve is a really big challenge for teams to take on. And it's impressive to see a swerve functioning here as well um, with having a little indexer. It looks like they're using a differential swerve pods. It's hard to tell if that's coaxial or if it's a differential swerve pod. It looks like it might. Oh, no, it's coaxial because it has a second servo here. I had to build wrote it in. One thing I'm curious about is just how rigid these things are going to be because it's rather small, compact. I think teams that do decide to go a swerve, one, they're going to make sure this thing's pretty bulletproof. And then two, you're probably going to make a, some sort of custom pathing system for yourself. Uh, I know that Pedro Pathing does support custom pathing to be able to put in, so you may be able to use Pedro as a pather for this, but it is going to make driving things around a little bit more challenging uh, with how you put in your own custom drive trains. Uh, and teams are really going to have to decide if all of that extra time and effort it takes to put in Swerve is worth the time and effort that it takes away from making some of your other systems more reliable. And on the Swerve, the big one I'm curious about this season is just how much more pushing power do these smaller Swerve robots have over a mechanism with a rather uh, low shore hardness. I think that's yet to be seen at the moment. We've seen a lot of examples from FRC. But we haven't seen a lot in an FTC world, and there's a big difference between when things are practically done in the real world and when things are done in theory. In any case, this is awesome to see, and I always love seeing that cool engineering. So thank you for sharing that one out with us. Our last one here I want to show is 15097. This is Python. This is their first test run. Keep in mind, so it's not very fast, but I did want to show off this robot uh, because I want you to look at how their mechanism drive is oriented. They are driving to the side for their mechanism wheel orientation, as opposed to where most teams end up driving. This is similar to that previous team we saw earlier, and I like their spin dexter. They have some plexi, or sorry, polycarbonate that's bent up on the side here, but the driving around the side is really interesting. I think it's worthwhile to talk about driving in on the side. Now, again, similar to what we just talked about with robots driving around in practicality versus driving around in theory. With mechanism drives, in theory, your forward speed is the same as your strafing speed. In practice, your strafing speed is going to be 5 to 10% slower just because of some of those additional uh, forces that I have found playing against those side mechanism rollers. So while 5 to 10% might not be a huge impact, it is something to think about with their robot in that specific design. Uh, it might not, and again, it ends up being a packaging thing, and it's yet to see whether that is uh, beneficial or detrimental. I do know that some of these robots that have set up, or at least that we've seen, that have the mechanisms on the side, do end up having rather wide intakes at the front, which is definitely going to be a benefit for teams having such a wide intake. In any case, excellent job on this rotating spindexer. 
it's your first test, so you've got some more tuning to do here, but this is impressive work for this one, Team Python. So keep it up. Next, Avery, I want to share an intake here from Axiomatic Robotics. Uh, just because I want to show you just how easy it is to get some of these intakes up and prototyped. Like I want to show you their quick prototype here if we can pause it when their intake finishes here. They have some sprockets and they've literally just wrapped rubber bands around the sprockets. So you do not have to make custom parts for all this stuff. You can do rapid prototyping with parts that you have on hand. And I think that large sprocket wheels with some rubber bands or surgical tubing it's a great way of testing, does this concept work for our robot? Is it better than our current design? And doing some things in some sort of lo-fi testing. Excellent job on this. I love seeing it. And thank you for sharing out your lo-fi testing. Next up here, we've got a interesting base prototype here from team 11646 Zubotics. I want to show this team out for two reasons. They have a really great way of describing their design choices and being very purposeful with their design choices. And then I want to share off this little kickstand design. Really cool. It is similar to the every bot that we've seen, but rather than being looks like a rack and pinion drive, it just looks like it's a quick little DC motor rotation section. And it means that they're up on one side here and off on another side here. And it looks like they've attempted to have this little triangle act as a base and it hasn't quite worked out. It looks like they might have to move it forward a little bit to be able to actually have that base put in. Because presently, and again, this is just a test, but presently this does not count as transitively supported on the tape because you have to be fully within the tape, and it should be clear to a judge that you're fully within the tape. But the cool thing about that design is that it only takes a half of that base. So it does get them, at, if they could find another robot that's capable of doing something similar, that's great that they could run into another robot here on the side. But it does, at minimum, allow them to get at least an additional five points for their base. So rather than 10 points of getting a full robot base back in, it's possible they could have their full robot based in and a half point. One thing they might want to think about is adding some sort of visual marker on the side of their robot so they know where they might need to line up with this field here rather than just doing a guess as to where things is. At this point, you'd be missing out on five points. Putting a visual marker, even a piece of tape saying that, hey, if this piece of tape, when we have driven up to here, once this piece of tape is over the line, you are good and you're ready to be supported, uh, which would be a really cool uh, piece to see. Excellent thinking on that one, Team Zubotics. Let's move on to another base here. We've got FTC Team 5954, and uh, they've taken some linear slides here and a really clever way of making their linear slides get a little bit longer here. It almost looks like linear rails on a simple pulley. So take a look at these rails up here as time goes by. So it's going to start lifting itself up. And then these flick up to be able to continue on their linear rail so that it can. You can see where it actually jumps onto the second rail over there. I think that's super neat as a first prototype. That's awesome. And I love seeing some interesting things like this. You can actually see that they've got this thing spring tensioned here. So that's how it actually goes up here. You've got a tensioning string here. And as this pushes up, you can see that they lock into place and it continues that linear rail all the way down. And it looks like they've got some linear rails riding up and then a positive lock at the end. Super cool work. I love seeing some passive compliant mechanisms like this. It is a really interesting piece of engineering. It is super shaky. That is completely okay at this point in stage. Do I think that this is Team 5954's final prototype? No. Do I think it's an excellent first prototype for how teams might approach uh, this base? Yes. Awesome job on this. Love seeing it and really creative work on that extra flipping to be able to add yourself onto that second one. Looks like it does, you might need a little more spring tension on this side as it flicks up, because it doesn't look like it always sits in, which is why you're getting that extra little launch down in the bottom. In any case, nice job on that one, Mr. Joe Weber and Team 5954. Now, last up, the one you guys have been waiting for is talking about how do we approach some of your autonomous and your seasons. So this is a playoff match here from PlaySpace QT number three, number seven. And the robots to watch here are team 23224 in the top right hand. Oh no, sorry, that's the wrong alliance. It is 22297 and 8404 in the bottom right hand corner. This was, I believe, at one point in time, a world record. I believe that on the exact same day that world record was taken away by one other point by a different team. But in any case, the strategy here is really impressive. So take a look at what this black robot is doing. 
and this white here. So 8404, the black robot shoots up to get just these three preloads right from the start. These teams have clearly collaborated because they say, okay, I'm going to fire my first shots. You wait a few seconds, then I'm going to fire my shots again so that their balls are not uh, colliding with each other in the air. That's one thing that teams are going to have to be thinking about. It looks like they're trying to find some balls here. But let's go back a few seconds and continue to focus on the black robot before we focus in here. So they picked up these three for the next spike marker. They've opened up the gate and then they have launched another three. Now take a look at this strategy here. I think this is really smart. So they've come over here, they've grabbed three more, and then they fired again. This black robot is opening up the gate, takes some time to be able to open the gate, and they're grabbing some of these spike marks. Now let's go back to the start of that autonomous and let's watch team 8404 and what it is that they are doing. So we see that this black robot fires first, and then a few half second later, this robot here fires. So they've cleared that time base, and then this robot grabs these three. And then watch what 8404 is doing. It goes back into the corner again to attempt to grab a few more. Fires again. They open up their gate here. It goes back into the corner to attempt to open up a few more. It's going to fire again. And then it's going to go back into the corner again. So the only thing that team 8404 is doing is starting that point, launching the preloads, going back, loading, coming back, going back, loading, coming back, going back, loading, coming back. And this team 22297 is spending most of their time coming up and opening the gate and grabbing the preloaded sections in here as opposed to focusing on the other sections. I think that's a really smart way of approaching the autonomous period. And it's also, what seems to be me, a pretty easy way for teams to be able to start getting more than just one gate of things in. Uh, and that's a strategy that I think teams are going to have to start developing as time goes by. What's going to be interesting looking at this is just how much do these teams collaborate with one another as their autonomous start going. I think you're going to have to have teams that are front autonomous and grabbing and other teams that are feed autonomous. And perhaps teams that, and I'm not saying that 8404 does not have the autonomous chops here, but what I am saying is that you have 22297 has a far more challenging autonomous path to be able to follow than Team 8404 does. So if Team 8404, or if your team uh, wants to come up with a quick autonomous, you can just cycle this way. And then you can hope that you're going to be able to be partnered up with another partner whose autonomous uh, plays well with yours. So being able to write up autonomous is able to go ahead and grab the preloads here. And then being able to have a second autonomous that's just constantly feeding those. I think that's going to be a really critical way that teams are going in, especially finding a way that they can get things into that corner. Because we can see even on team 8404 here that they do struggle to grab some things in the corner. I think a good chunk of robots are going to struggle to be able to pick things up uh, in a corner if they're not able to sufficiently get in and move those things around. Something to think about. In any case, this is truly, well, truly world-class work here from 8404 and 22297, and there's an excellent partnership. I also see that some of those initial final points in those alliances really being baked into how well do you play with your partner. So teams that can play together well is going to be really, really critical this season. If you're looking for more CAD resources or code snippets from MMA tutorials, you can consider joining the community down below. Uh, if you'd like your robot potentially featured on FC Fridays, there's a submission form in the comments down below, uh, and I'll take a look at that and see if we can format uh, some of your creative ideas. I'm curious what your thoughts are on this team's final autonomous strategy and how we might start getting some rather high uh, ranking point scores as time goes by. And as always, best of luck out there this FTC season.